Hey, this is Mark Shepard, Mark Shepard Songs, A Life in Song, and I have been thinking a lot about a couple of different thematic ideas, and one of which is thoughts about music, things that music does for all of us that helps to transcend differences between people and also helps to keep us emotionally alive and happy and healthy. Music is very important in that way. But there's a whole other side of music. And those of us who make music, who feel deeply drawn to a career in music, a creative career in music, there's a line where music slips into some really tricky stuff. And I call this series, Why Musicians Do Drugs. <laughs> because as musicians, we tend to be a little more attuned to others outside ourselves. We tend to be a little more susceptible to bullying. We tend to be a little bit more self-aware. We tend to, because as a good musician, like music affects us, like really good music affects me. Like for example, I do not listen to music in the background. If I'm gonna to listen to music, I sit or walk or drive and listen to music. I don't have a conversation with somebody while music is playing in the background. That absolutely jars me. And when I go to a music experience or musical performance, where half the audience are having conversations with each other and using the music as background, that just fries my circuits. And when I'm the musician performing and I'm trying to communicate and make connections with an audience and somebody is standing in the back chatting, that, that really, really jars me and I find it triggers me to really work on my stuff. <laughs> so music does different things to different people and music seems to be something that people appreciate in different ways. But it, it has the ability to go deep beyond our surfaces. And I don't know how to, how to articulate some of this but I just feel like there are enough of us out here who care about music so deeply and who are willing to actually explore new kinds of music, music that we might not have ever listened to when we were teenagers. Like there are a group of people who will never listen to anything that they didn't hear before, right? And that group of people, God bless them, they're not my audience because I'm writing new music or I'm writing music or I have written music that is new to most people. And I get how the human mind and the human ear needs familiarity with music sometimes. And even Paul McCartney can't seem to get people to listen to his new stuff. People want to hear his old stuff, right? And that's not... That's not bad. It's just what do you do as a songwriter of someone as someone who creates new songs and and how songwriting is a difficult art form in that way. As a songwriter, like as an art form, songwriting, singer songwriting, singer songwriting, being a singer songwriter is challenging in many ways because Let's compare it to visual art. When I paint a painting, and this was so healing to me when I finally kind of got that if I just painted a painting, it was actually, I paint and I'm recording the movements of my brush. Like I'm not painting a landscape or a still life or any of this kind of stuff. I just mix the paint on the canvas and I paint and with visual art, someone can look at it and go, oh, I like that. Or someone can go, eh, and then they look at something else, right? With music, 
Like if I play a new song for you, quite often it may take two or three listens for you to actually allow that song into the, the sweet spot of your neurology. And that's asking someone to invest time. Whereas a painting, you look at it, eh, it's not my thing. Or if you look and you go, wow, I feel really good when I look at that. That happens in an instant. But with songwriting, it takes a while. And it's like on another, the, the third thing, storytelling, people want to hear a story they've never heard before. Oh, what happens next, right? That engages us. People want to see a painting and they can decide in a second whether they like it or not. And if they don't like it, they just turn their head and look at something that they do like, right? <laughs> with songwritering, it's like, I need you to stop. I need you to stop and just take five to seven minutes of your life and give me a freaking chance, right? But people are so busy and they're just moving on, moving on, moving on, TikTok, TikTok, you know, YouTube shorts, just whoosh, 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 scroll, scroll, swipe left, swipe right, whatever, whatever we're doing. And songs need to be heard. In the past, you could not avoid new songs. They were on the radio and you would hear other people's radios or you'd be driving in the car and the radio would be playing what the radio was playing. You didn't have a choice in the car. You had, like in my childhood, we had a Chevy 2 station wagon. It was blue. It was a small station wagon and it had an AM radio. That's it. AM radio and there were five presets and you would push the little button for the preset and you would get your local radio station. And we listened to WABC in New York City, 77 WABC, and they played the hits, right? That was it. They played the hits and then FM radio came in. So then you could listen to FM radio in your car, but you still, you didn't have a choice as to what to play in your car. And then there was these eight track tapes and you could get an eight track player and you could play that in your car so you could choose what album you wanted to listen to but the eight track player you just had to play it in order you didn't get to kind of mix it up and play it at random you didn't get that and then cassettes came and we could play play those in the car until a cassette mechanism jammed which always happened because the 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 magnetic tape that was in the cassettes would eventually kind of gum up on the, the little gears inside. And then we had the CD and all of a sudden things changed, right? And then we had the internet. And now, like I just was talking to uh, Roger Mock, the music director at Unity Church, and he had never heard of Jacob Collier. Holy crap. So I said, dude, I'm going to do the biggest favor that anybody can do. I'm going to introduce you to Jacob Collier. Check his stuff out, right? If you haven't heard of Jacob Collier, go to YouTube and start exploring Jacob Collier, right? Watch some of his interviews, listen to his music, see what he's doing. And you will be restored to faith, right? But Jacob did something very wise. He started by doing cover songs. He started by rearranging and making his own in a completely unique and new way, songs that everybody knew. And I get that. And that's something I have not been drawn to in the past, but I'm starting to be more drawn to singing songs that really touch me and move me, songs that saved my life, songs that have been healing for me as a human being that I didn't write. But I also have to record and even write new songs that no one's ever heard. So the conundrum and the feeling of no one gives a shit is sometimes difficult as an artist to deal with because as musicians, we tend to be more sensitive. We tend to be sensitive to rejection. We, we tend to have feelings. We tend to be aware of other people's feelings and if you've played with a musical group, you understand why we have to be sensitive to what the other musicians are doing. And that also leaves us vulnerable to bullying. It leaves us vulnerable 
to doubting ourselves. There's all kinds of psychological conundrums, dead ends, traps, La Brea tar pits that musicians get caught in because we are emotionally available. So today, and I want to just wrap this up. This is all stream of consciousness. I haven't planned this out. I'm just trying to find a way to express the things that frustrate me and that I am working on. And I'm working on not being attached to the fact that having written songs for 50 years, I still can barely get enough people to listen to justify the amount of expense, time, effort, and intensity that songwriting is for me. And the bottom line is I have to write songs for me. And Jacob Collier in one of his recent interviews said, you know, no, you have to do it for yourself. You have to make the music you need and want to make. And he's a great example of someone who's doing that brilliantly. And you also have to be aware that not everybody's going to like your music. That's, that's another step we have to take as musicians. We have to learn to let go of craving other people's approval. And at the same time, it's an art form that requires an audience, and audiences clap their approval after a song. And if they don't like it, they don't clap, right? And finding the right audience... Finding the people that actually get what I'm doing and why what I'm doing is different and why it might be worth their time and attention, that's a whole can of worms that I struggle with continuously. I have struggled with it. I'm doing better than I used to. But it's another reason why musicians do drugs because having an art form that people don't actually want. Having to do an art, having to write songs that you don't have a choice to not write. Songs come in and they want to be written and you have to write them and then you have to sing them but no one wants to listen. That is painful. It's been very painful for me over my lifetime and I'm at the point now where I'm just recording my music and putting it up on YouTube, whether anybody watches it, whether anybody hears it or not, and where I'm doing one or two things a month, I get to sing a couple of songs every month at Unity Church in Albany. I could do a whole program, but I I get to do two. And to stay focused on gratitude for the two songs I get to do with an actual live audience is huge. But I want more, and I'm working on being not attached. And then once a month, I do a program up here in Canton, New York. I'm calling it Second Saturday, and it's a spiritual but not religious thing. And I'm trying to help this local little church keep going, the Brick Chapel. And I'm trying to get people to come. I'm trying to get other musicians to collaborate with me. And I'm so on the edge of my stuff coming up, feeling rejected, feeling like no one cares, feeling why bother. And that, my friends, is yet another reason why musicians do drugs. Now, that said, music itself is one of the most powerful healing, let's call it a medicine, that there is. There's so many levels with music, but the first level, level one, we have to do it for ourselves. Music can be healing. Music can be transforming. Music can be play. Music can be joyful. And for many musicians who are talented and who find that joy and sustenance in music, to then take the next step and go, okay, I want to do this for a career, that's when the trouble starts and the drugs start flowing. I hate to say. So we haven't solved anything today, but I think I've expressed a little of what I tried to express. And if you are a musician and you've experienced this kind of stuff, I would love to hear from you in the comments. If you are someone who actually listens to music and actually seeks out new music, oh my God, thank you. Thank you for coming here. Please check out my channel. 
Please subscribe. Please leave a comment below. Please give it a thumbs up, all that kind of stuff. I need your help because I can't do this by myself. I can't do it by myself, but I have to start where I am and I have to start in my garage here making and recording the music that wants me to make it. After that, I don't know what else to do other than what I've been doing. So that's it for today. This has been yet another exciting episode of Why Musicians Do Drugs and Why Music Can Quite Possibly Save Our Lives, Save Our Communities, Save the World. Peace, love, grooviness. Amen.